الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic of this evening's presentation is that of the rationale behind Islamic law. And this topic is a direct product of the question which is often raised concerning Islam and the laws of Islam. That there are too many laws. People ask, why are there so many laws? You know, it makes Islam too difficult. Some people may be interested in some aspects of Islam, but when they're informed that there are these laws which govern life, etc., etc., they become reluctant, feeling that there are too many laws in Islam. Why are there so many? You know, where is the freedom for human beings to choose for themselves, etc., etc.? So, in order to be able to answer such a question uh, effectively, it is very important for us to understand the rationale behind Islamic laws, the whys. Now, one basic principle that we need to understand with regards to Islamic law and re with regards to laws in general is that the laws provide a system and an organization for the religious life of the Muslim. People coming out of, say, Christian tradition or other traditions of religions that are very loose find some difficulty in accepting the idea of laws governing, governing all aspects of human life. However, if they were to reflect on day-to-day -day life, when a person wants to set up a business for it to run effectively, he has to set up a series of laws. He must have laws governing that business from the time it is open till the time it is closed. Times to be there, how much money is to be paid, how much, you know, profits, what they should be. He sets a whole series of conditions and principles, etc., to govern his business. If it is not properly planned, then the likelihood is that he will fail. As they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So that planning, the planning involves setting principles and laws which are going to govern that business that you're setting up. We recognize the importance of it in our daily lives. Everything that functions effectively in society functions effectively when the laws governing it are followed. Now, why should we separate our spiritual life from our material life? If we can recognize the importance of laws in our material life, our physical life, surely, logically, reasonably, we can see that there must also be laws for our governing and guiding our spiritual life. Because if we are left to run a business without laws, what we have in that business is chaos. And if we are left to run our spiritual lives without laws, then what we will also have is chaos. We will not worship Allah consistently as we will not in business succeed consistently. So, we can say basically that the laws, the Islamic system of laws are designed 
to organize the spiritual and material life of the human being because in the Islamic system there is no separation between the material and the spiritual. So it is there to organize all facets of his life. To organize it in such a way that the human being fulfills the commandments of God in all aspects of their lives. That is every single thing that you may do in a day, whether it be in your home, in the society, out in your car or in the bus or the train or on your job, in the restaurant, whatever you do, there are laws from God governing them. There are things which are pleasing to God that he wishes for us to do and there are things which are displeasing to God which he does not wish for us to do. So the Islamic system helps us to fulfill the wish of God in our 24 hour a day lives. Now, with the laws which prohibit us from doing things, what we find is that these laws are fundamentally there to protect the human being. Allah has not set these laws arbitrarily. That is, he just felt like making a law for you, making life difficult, etc. So he made this law. No. Allah, the most wise, who understands the workings of man, his society, his needs, his destiny. He has ordained for us laws which will protect us from harm, whether to our physical beings or to our spiritual being. This is the goal behind the various prohibitions in Islamic law. And the laws of Islam are generally divided into two main categories. Into those which are referred to as ibadat, acts of worship which are related to the, re to the link or the relationship between man and God. And these may be of a purely religious nature, as in the case of salah, prayer, the five times daily prayer, and fasting, so. Or they may be socio-economic, as in the case of zakah, where money is distributed in Muslim community, or hajj, where we spend of our monies, as well as uh, we're involved in uh, purely religious acts. And the second grouping is usually referred to as mu'amalat, and those cover the dealings between men, between human beings. These themselves may be divided into laws which prop, uh, or help men in the propagation of Islam. And these laws are included under the general heading of jihad, fighting in the way of Allah, defending the faith. Then we have family laws, second grouping marriage, divorce, etc. We have trade laws, which have to do with our business, what is allowable to be sold, what is not. And we have criminal laws, which govern the needs of the society in terms of crimes. How, what category do we put them in? And how do we treat those who commit these crimes? What is important for us to note with regards to all of these laws is that the basis for the legislation of Islamic law is to reform the human condition, to improve human state. And that the Islamic law, for the most part, is constructive and not destructive. When Islam arose in Arabia, it did not cancel out everything that the Arabs were doing wipe out everything and bring in a new set of laws altogether. No. 
there were some laws which were absorbed within the body of Islamic law. It doesn't mean that Islam has taken laws from other than the divine sources. It's not what it means at all. The reason why the Islamic laws have included some of the customs of the people of that time is because when we look at the customs of people, they may be in the category of practices which were inherited from the messages of the earlier prophets. For example, in most societies you will find laws against murder. The fact that Islam comes into an area and prohibits murder, it doesn't mean that it has taken that law from an, uh, an, uh, a, a source which is not divine, no. Because those laws which prohibit murder, these are from the earlier revelations which came to the prophets that were sent to these areas. So what is correct, Islam confirms. It doesn't have to wipe out everything. It confirms what is correct. Similarly, things which are a result of human intellectual effort, human reason. In our society, we will come up with certain laws, for example, like the traffic laws, for the purpose of you know, avoiding accidents, organization. Islam, if Islam, for example, established itself in the country here, it would not do away with all traffic signs and say, well, no, traffic signs belong to, you know, a Buddhist or Kafir disbelieving society. We have to come up with something new. No. Traffic signs are valid. They're useful, beneficial to human society. So Islam would confirm this. So whatever is a product of human reason, because Islam appeals to the human intellect, it is reasonable. Because it is for, from God and human reason is from God. So it makes sense that revelation, what has been reve revealed by God, will appeal to and will confirm what human intellectual, sound intellectual reasoning has produced. The third main category is that of human need. There are some things which every society needs. And these things, if they did not exist in a society which Islam came, it would institute them. If they already existed, again, Islam would merely confirm them. However, I should say that the vast majority of the laws which were confirmed in the society of Arabia when Islam arose there, were modified in one way or another. They were not confirmed exactly as is. There were modifications which took place. Either because the laws which had come down from earlier generations from the prophets had become distorted in how they were implemented. For example, like the Hajj. You know, the practice of Hajj went back all the way to Prophet Abraham. Alayhi salam. So... When Islam arose in Mecca, the people were practicing Hajj. They made Hajj. But how did they make Hajj? They were making tawaf around the Kaaba naked. So Islam came. I mean, there's certain things. This is just not acceptable. So Islam prohibited the tawaf around the Kaaba. It, it, it confirmed. But naked, no. People had to be clothed. So like this, you'll find that, you know, for example, marriage practices. People uh, had a system, different systems of marriage. Islam came and Recognize this is a need, human society, for it to be organized properly. There should be marriage uh, practices there, a system of marriage. So Islam came, it looked at the various systems that were there, it canceled most of them, and it confirmed one or two of them. Modifying here or there. So this was how Islam approached uh, the existing laws and does approach in any given circumstance the existing laws in any society. The fundamental goal of Islam or Islamic law is to remove difficulty from human beings. Though people tend to think of Islam as being a set of burdens. We're burdened now with prayer five times a day. 
before you had the choice, if you're a Christian, you could just pray on Sunday, if you felt like it, you know, whereas now it's five times a day. So there appears to be a burden here. How can we say Islam makes things easy? And, and this is not a philosophy here, because Allah has said in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 185, This is clear. Allah wishes for you ease. He doesn't wish for you difficulty. So this is not something I'm bringing you philosophically. This is something right out of the Quran itself. We also have in Surah Al-Hajj, this is Surah 22, verse uh, 78, Allah says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ That Allah has not made for you in the religion any difficulty. This is the principle. There is no difficulty there. However, with a distorted understanding, what may in fact be good and make your life easy may appear to you to be difficult. If you have a distorted understanding of what prayer is. For example, if you think that prayer is merely the ritual of going through these physical movements that is done, we learn the standing, the rukur, the sujood, making wudu beforehand and these things. If one thinks of prayer merely in these terms, that these physical actions you have to do, and you have to stop your day and do this, and you have to remember, and there are times, and so on and so, then this may seem to be a burden, an obligation, which if we didn't have it, our life would be easier. However, if we consider that the goal of a human being is righteousness, righteousness, that we live a life pleasing to God. If this is a goal, worship of God, which is righteousness, if this is the goal of life, then when we are obliged to pray to God five times every day, what we have been given is a system of organizing our day around the remembrance of God which will help us during those periods. We remember God, we get up in the morning to remember God. As a person who is not conscious, you get up in the morning so you can prepare yourself to go out to work, to deal with your material needs because the work is to provide you with money so you can get a nice home and you know buy a nice car and you know live comfortably, your television, your video, and you know, this is, this is what getting up in the morning is about. But if you are a believer in God, if you believe that you have to return back to God and that righteousness is the key to returning to God pleasurably to attain paradise, then you will be able to grasp that remembrance of God is key. Because when we remember God, we are righteous. When we forget God, we become evil. That's a very simple formula, but not very complicated for us. Good and evil, very simple. We can understand how it happens. When you remember God, when you're conscious of God, then you're good. When you forget God, when you put God out of your mind, then you become evil. That's very straightforward. So, for the believer, because his goal is righteousness... Remembrance of God helps him to practice righteousness. Then when he gets up in the morning, he gets up to remember God. First and foremost. Now after remembering God, dealing with his spiritual needs, then he deals with his material needs. He eats food and prepares himself to go out to work, etc. When he breaks at midday, he's not breaking for lunch to fit, fill his stomach so he can continue working to produce more uh, material so that he, he can benefit his material life. No, he breaks at, in midday to worship God, to remember God, to help himself in righteousness. And the idea between getting up in the morning for Fajr and praying at Zuhur 
is not that we remember God at Fajr, then we forget him after we go to work and become a crook, you know, stealing from people, cheating, lying, all these different things. Then all of a sudden at Duhur, we become pious again. No. The idea here is that between those times of worship, we are to remember God also. By having at least those two times, it is easier to remember in between. But if we had no times, then it's very easy to forget. So that system of worship, praying five times a day, organizing our day around the worship of God, this helps us, it makes it easier for us to remember God and to be righteous. So God has ordained for us the five times daily prayer to make our lives easier in righteousness. So the ease is there. Furthermore, what we find is that even with this ease which Allah has given us in terms of organizing our day around the worship, He has given us along with it certain concessions. That is, when you are a traveler, when you're traveling, you are allowed to shorten your prayers which are four units down to two. And also to pray those, you know, that Dhuhr and Asr, you can pray them together. And Maghrib and Isha, you can pray together. These are further concessions which Allah has provided to make life easier for us. Make our spiritual life easier for us. Make the path to righteousness and to paradise easier for us. So fundamentally, the goal of Islamic law is to make the path of righteousness easier for man. And we also see in the various religious obligations that when you add up the total number of things which are prohibited, you find that in fact they are extremely few in comparison to those that we are allowed to do. The things that we are prohibited from doing, you'll find Allah names them by name. Like the foods that we can't eat. You read in the surah which describes the animals that are, which die in certain ways, you can't eat them. The one which is beaten, beaten on the head or its neck has been, it's been strangled or it's been gored or it's fallen off a cliff or whatever. These animals are prohibited to us, specified. But then after that, Allah leaves it wide open. All of the other categories are left wide open for us. So the things that are halal and allowable to us are many. And the things which are prohibited us are few. And as I said again, all of the prohibitions are there for the protection of man. To protect him from harm, either on a spiritual level or on a physical level. For example, on a spiritual level, in terms of both the, I'm not just talking about the prohibitions now, but also in terms of the things which have been made compulsory for us. I mentioned the case of Salah. This helps us to remember God. We also have Zakah. Zakah helps us to be generous. We have fasting, which helps us to be sympathetic to those who don't have. It also helps to train us to control our desires. So we see these are all control of desires, sympathy, to have sympathy for others, uh, generosity. All of these are the higher spiritual qualities. These things have been commanded for us to help us to develop these. On the same time, there are certain things which have been prohibited for us, uh, which will help to protect our spiritual beings. For example, the idea of bowing, standing, or prostrating for other people. In Islam, it is prohibited for us to stand in honor. When you hear the national anthem, you have people standing up for the anthem. 
when the judge comes in the courtroom, everybody has to stand in the court. When the king comes or the, this one, the governor or whatever, you find people standing for. And this has come right down even into our educational systems. When the teacher comes in the classroom, all the students have to stand. Actually, Islam has prohibited this altogether. When the companions stood for the Prophet Muhammad he forbade them. He said, don't stand for me. Because anybody who, in, who likes people to stand for him, for him in this life will stand in the hellfire in the next. Why? Because this act of standing in honor of others eats away at our spirit. We stand in prayer only, we stand for Allah. This is in prayer. We stand for Allah. Similarly, we only bow to Allah. And we only make prostration to Allah. And this is why the prayer has been, the prayer has been set in these forms. Because people sometimes wonder, why in our prayer we stand, we bow, and we prostrate? Because in this world, when people seek to impress their will on others, they do so by having people stand for them. If they are stronger, then the people bow to them. And if they are very strong, then the people prostrate to them. So our system of prayer have taken these forms of showing honor to man and made them specifically for God alone. So we do not bow for others. We don't prostrate and we don't stand. On a physical level, we see things like Islam prescribing that we eat with the right hand. Some people might say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Why do we have to eat with the right hand? Well, Islam has set up a system. You eat with the right hand and you clean yourself when you go to the bathroom with your left hand. So there's a system there. It's only in modern times when people discovered the uh, microscope that they were able to find out that diseases are spread by germs, etc. And so it did make sense that you don't use the same hand that you clean with to eat with. You see, it made sense. Well, of course, somebody will say, well, today we're using knives and forks, no need for this, so and so. However, you know, knives and forks are, are we may use now, but you may find yourself in circumstances where you may not have knives and forks to eat with. And you may have to go back to your natural knife and fork, your hand. So that system stands because it is for all times. It is for everywhere. You have your hand with you everywhere you go. Knife and fork, you know, you don't, can't necessarily carry with you everywhere. So the system is there. And it benefits us. We can find, for example in the prohibition of the pig. Benefit in the sense that the pig was one of the main carriers of trichnosis. This is something found out in recent times. However, Muslims benefited from all Allah. Furthermore, we find a very profound example in the prohibition given by Prophet Muhammad for people to lie on their stomachs. <clears throat> the Prophet Muhammad came across one of his companions lying on his stomach, sleeping on his stomach. So he nudged him with his foot. When the man awoke, he told him, don't lie that way. This is the way the people of hell lie. So traditionally Muslims do not sleep on their stomachs. This is Islamic tradition based on the fact that the Prophet Muhammad said that. It's considered mokru, disliked in Islam to sleep on your stomach. What has happened is that in recent times, <clears throat> after extensive studies by Western medical practitioners, and this is information I'm giving you from a number of articles which I've read, particularly in Time magazine, which went into details about the back problems that people face, curvature of the spine, 
you know, slip discs, etc. I read a particular article at the end of it. They had a series of doctor's recommendations after describing the various problems that people face and the various uh, uh, operations that they developed to cure these problems. Number one on the list was do not sleep on your stomach. Now, I had been asked prior to the time that I read this article, why is Islam not allow us to sleep on the stomach? I really didn't have an answer. I knew Prophet Muhammad said don't because this is the way people of the hellfire lie. I said, okay, fine. I don't do it. There must be some harm in there too. You know? Because Islam is not calling us to give up things which are in fact beneficial to us. Nor is it calling us to do things which are harmful to us. It's just the opposite. What it calls us to do is beneficial to us. And what it prohibits us from doing is harmful to us. Fundamentally. So I just accepted it. As the rest of the Muslim world accepted it. However, this article for me was like a revelation. Because when I read it, it just really brought home to me you know, the, the beauty of Islam. And the, the, the fact that Islam is the religion of God. It is revelation from God. Because here medical science was pointing out the same thing. Don't sleep on your stomach. But they went on to explain why. So alhamdulillah, I found even some added information that, you know, it's useful for clarity for people to see the wisdom that exists in Islam. Because Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago, you know, did not give us these kind of details. These details have become revealed to us in these times. They explain, the medical doctors explain, that when a person sleeps on his stomach, the spinal cord, spine, which is the heaviest bony structure in his body, when he sleeps on his stomach, there is no support for it. All in front of it are soft organs, your intestines, you know, your stomach, your uh, heart, lungs, everything. These are all soft, spongy organs. So the spine sags downwards, sags downwards because there's nothing to support it. You see, so after sleeping like that, this becomes your habit. In later life, you end up with your, you see people walking around with their backs curved like this. They said, this is a result of this curvature of the spine in later life. Many of the other back problems, slip discs and, and crushed discs are traced back to this. They said the best way to sleep is either on your back or on your side with your knees bent. And when we go back to the Sunnah, we find that the way that the Prophet Muhammad slept was on his right side with his knees bent. That's his way. So I said, Alhamdulillah. But not only did that, I find that out, and I found that out you know, a number of years back, actually. It was maybe about eight or nine years ago that I read this article. But a couple of years ago, two years ago, in England, medical doctors were doing research on what is called SDS, the Sudden Death Syndrome. They call it cot death. For little children, one years old, two years old, they're put in their beds by the mothers. The mother comes back, finds them dead. No cause. They can't find any reason why they're dying, but you have kids dying all around the world. So they're trying to find out what is the reason for these kids dying. And so what, what they did was they tried to analyze, get information back from the mothers, you know, about the child, his background, the way he was sleeping, his breathing habits, all these different types of things. And then they put it all down in computer and then they're trying to see what are the common factors to all of them, which may be one of the leading factors. Guess what? Number one on the list of common factors, which they said afterwards, do not do, is sleeping on the stomach. So these doctors said, do not put your children to sleep on their stomach. Because the children which are dying from cut death, this is a common factor. How it is related, they're not certain. But somehow, these children are dying who sleep on the stomachs, put to sleep on the stomachs. Recently, they said that uh, it may have to do with a genetic uh, defect wherein people in breathing, uh, uh, some people having this genetic defect, whilst in sleep, they will stop breathing, for instance, and then they start breathing again. That when the child is put on the, st the chest here, 
You see, when the breathing stops, it is more difficult for it to start breathing again. This is what they have proposed. Some have proposed that this may be the factor involved. In any case, this is revelation. Allah revealing to us through medical science the wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago. And when we look at this, we look at this and we look at the rest of Islam in the same light. We have, for example, the example where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if a fly falls in one of your drinks, you have a drink and a fly falls in it, right? Dunk him in, then throw him out and drink. Because under one wing is disease and under the other wing is its cure. Now, doctors, you know, scientists today, they say, ah, no, 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 no. With the fly, all we know about the fly is that it's got disease and you know, this is dangerous. No, don't, don't. If the fly falls in your drink, throw away your drink. But the thing is that if you went back 50 years or 100 years and you told people that there is in poison, snake poison, a cure or an aid, a, a, a medicine for people who have heart problems, they will say to you, you are mad. When a person is bitten by a snake, that poison stops his heart and he dies. But... Today, snakes, snake poison is collected in India and in other countries and sold to the West, the, which, which extract from the snake poison uh, substances which they use for treating heart disease. So for us, because medical science right at this instant cannot find the cure that is in the fly, right? And I know I just recently read about how medical science is now accepting the Chinese uh, cure using the ant, right? Ground ants, that it's good for rheumatism. You know, they have found that there's a connection. There really is a, a, uh, a chemical connection and, and a medical connection, which before they used to scoff at. The Chinese, was, they had this wet remedy of, you know, grinding up uh, ants and using it to, for curing rheumatism. The West used to scoff at this stuff. Now, they're accepting it. So what they may scoff at today, because of their limited knowledge, we shouldn't fall into that trap. And I mention this to you for one reason, particularly, because um, there is a book called uh, Islam, or the Bible, the uh, Quran and Science, by Dr. Maurice Bokai. For the most part, the book is excellent. It's a comparison between Quran and the Bible, you know, from science, from science background, showing you systematically that the Quranic view of the world is 100% agreeing with science. Whereas the Bible, you have so many ideas in the Old Testament which contradict what is known to be scientific fact. Not fiction or theory, but fact. Very beautiful book. And this man's research led him to accept Islam. He's a French uh, medical doctor who studied, learned Arabic, studied the Quran, and made this comparison and accepted Islam. However, in the latter part of his book, he started to talk about hadith, statements of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And this hadith about the fly, it threw him for a loop. You see, because being a medical doctor, all he knows about the fly is that it causes disease. So I said, well, you know, we can't trust hadith because this fly causes disease and the Prophet said that there was a, you know, cure in it. You see, but he did not follow the same principles that he actually set in the beginning of his book. You know, he got off the track in medical science and he started now to uh, attack hadith as not being reliable merely because science is not able to identify the cure that lies in the fly. But this is a mistake on his part. So I'm just mentioning that to you to be aware that this was a mistake on his part in the latter part of the book. So, we said that the prohibitions and the commands of the Quran and the Sunnah of Islam, they are fundamentally there to make the spiritual goals of the human being 
more easily attainable. Allah created us to be in paradise. That's what he created us for. That's why Adam and Eve were created in paradise. Because that's where our destiny lies. However, we have been given a free will to either work through this life in righteousness to attain paradise in the next or not to, to reject righteousness, choose evil and earn for ourselves hell in the next. That's the reality. Islam, the system of worshipping God is there to make that path to paradise easier for us. Whatever has been prohibited or commanded in Islam is primarily to protect man spiritually or to protect him physically. Protecting him either as an individual or protecting the community as a whole. The needs of the individual are recognized as long as it doesn't present a problem for the community as a whole. This is why when a person says to you, why does Islam prohibit alcohol? For me, I only drink a little bit. I never get drunk, you know. Maybe I only take it in communion, you know, or on Sundays. I control my drink. So why should it become prohibited for me? Well, the law of Islam does recognize that there are some people, a few people, who are able to drink moderately and never get drunk. And so alcohol for them is not harmful. However, at the same time, it recognizes that the majority of people, when they are given alcohol, they cannot stop at moderation. And they end up getting drunk. And when they get drunk, then they commit heinous crimes. They massacre each other, you know, with their cars and their accidents, etc., etc. So since the greater harm of alcohol is so obvious, produces such havoc in society, Islam has banned it totally, even for the individual who drinks moderately. Because the law cannot come stating, for those people who drink moderately, you may drink. But for those who do not, you may not. No. The law can't come like that. Because everybody is going to say, I can drink moderately. It's pleasurable. So who is going to give it up? So the law has to come taking into account the need of the society as a whole to protect it. It will prohibit this from the individual, though that individual may take pleasure in it. As a closing point, because I want to give uh, an opportunity for questions, and our time slot here is rather limited, there is an aspect of Islamic practice which sometimes creates confusion for people. And that is the practice of favoring the right. You know, in Islam, if you're putting on your clothes you're encouraged to put on your right side before your left. If you're putting on your clothes, you have to put on your right side before your left. This is in Islam. Encourage. It's not compulsory. You, must, you, you are encouraged to put your right side on, you're putting on your pants, you're putting your right leg before your left leg. You're washing yourself, taking your bath, you wash your right side before your left side. You're making wudu, your right, right hand before your left hand, right foot before your left foot. Coming into the masjid, you're stepping with your right foot. Going into the bathroom, you're stepping with your left foot, you step out with your right foot. You know, putting on your shoes, put on your right foot first, then your left foot. Take off your shoes, you take off your left foot first and your right foot. Some people look at it and say, what is all this? 
What is all this left, right, left? What does it matter about all this left? You know, what do we need this, this for? What does it matter if we jumped in with both feet at the same time? We jumped out with both feet, you know? <laughs> what is the big concern about this? You know, especially for young people. I mean, why, why I'm mentioning this? Because, you know, I, I taught Islamic studies to uh, children in, uh, or young people in high school and junior high. And, and this was an issue for them, you know. So, and it is something which is really important to understand because, you see, if we teach Islam to our young people as just merely do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, you see, and they, they're, and they don't understand why then it's very difficult for them to accept it and to keep it. So when they come under pressure from the rest of the society, which is one of, you know, free for all, you know, you just do your own thing. It doesn't matter what you do, right? They are not able to withstand those pressures. They will not be able. So it is very important for us to look into the various practices of Islam. And the explanations are there. They're not very complicated. Islam is not, not so you know, deep and mysterious and so on so that you can't find the understanding for these things. Very important for us to understand them so that we can convey them to the younger generation so that they can make these things a part of their lives and understand why they do it. So, just in way of explanation to you, the, th the reason why Islam has preferred the right over the left. Besides the fact that it gives us an organization in our life, we're not like animals, although we are partly animal. You know, we belong to the animal kingdom. I mean, we share certain things with the animals. Allah has also given us a brain and an intellect by which we organize our lives, which, which makes us different from the animals, who are not governed you know, beyond certain basic instinctual things that they do. They don't, there is no reason involved there at all. So for us, when we organize the different aspects of our lives, it improves the quality of our life. So when we have this kind of organization in terms of what we do, what we've done here also is that we have remembered Allah. Because if you remember to put your right hand in first into your shirt, because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to do it, and we're doing it because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did it, and he was the best of examples, as Allah said for us, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا That the Messenger of Allah was the best of examples for us. You know, that reminds us of following that example. And in reminding us of following the example, we're remembering Allah. So in choosing to step in with our right foot first, we're again connecting us back, remembering Allah, putting us in the right frame of mind, going into the masjid. Furthermore, what we find is that Allah, when he describes the people going to paradise, he describes them as receiving their book of good deeds in their right hands. And those going to hell receiving it in their left hands behind their backs. So in remembering that also, remembering the favoring of the right, it is also reminding us of the day of judgment. We want to be amongst those who receive our book of good deeds in the right hand. Of righteousness, choosing the right over the wrong. So there is in these practices help for us on that path to paradise. And this is the way we should approach all of our Islamic practices. To understand them, to understand the wisdom behind them, understand the help that is in them for us in living righteous lives, lives which are pleasing to God and which are beneficial to ourselves in both this life and the next. And as I said, with that, I would like to stop after uh, this short recap of the presentation to allow you a chance to ask some further questions on the topic, which is the rationale behind Islamic laws, the whys, and the wherefores.